being a top-down association is really uh, <laughs> it really has its moments like everything being backwards having the experience of remembering God or union in God enlightenment beyond the body out of the body no body just the eternal light of creation as what you are part of it and all of it I know I can't explain it but having that experience first and then setting about consciously to release the defences of the false associations that the mind has turned into an identity based construct you think it would be easy and I know Jesus says blessed is those who uh, believe but have not seen but you think it would be easy having seen to apply the principles apply the teachings but I tell you there's moments where <laughs> there's moments where it's just the ongoing nature of it knowing that in a sense there's nothing to look forward to because you know what's already occurred but there's this kind of longing for the doneness of the transformative process so you're kind of looking forward to that it's like I, I know what's on offer here I've seen the seen the truth and yet still having to undergo the particulars of interacting with the world people and situations etc hey buddy is something that <sighs> if it weren't for the idea of um, being helpful <coughs> I don't know what the alternative to if it weren't the idea of being helpful would be but <coughs> the idea of letting go of just continually letting go letting go letting go and I think that impetus for letting go or the the emphasis for letting go is made all the more apparent because of the experience that I've had and anyone out there who's also had a profound non-temporal experience will probably know what I'm talking about if they're indeed uh, undergoing the process of purification that goes along with that that you need to embark upon to ground that experience in order to be useful in the world not grounding the experience of course just uh, the ego grabs a hold of that experience turns it into some kind of identity on its own and uh, before you know it um, you're in the loony bin <laughs> in D Ward uh, with a messiah complex you know and uh, it's very and I saw that actually I saw that probably within 12 months of my illumination, I saw the potential for the misuse of that experience as an idea of proclamation of something that wasn't yet truly mine wasn't yet truly grounded wasn't yet truly something I owned it's like I was shown it but I didn't actually you know and there, there's a point of maybe confusion contention something there's a point there where in the course Jesus says revelation shows you the truth but the means are needed to reach it and I think just to have that experience without the process of purifying the mind that it aligns you with it in a useful way or in a way that's helpful um, that's exactly what that's kind of doing it's um, confusing 
what you've seen with what it is you think you are now. But also in the course, Jesus says, uh, even though God created you perfect, you're not perfect now. You Or you don't believe that about yourself now. And you're, the process of your purification is so that you come to accept your perfection, you know, and that you, you become perfect. And that's... Even in the Bible, he says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, so the acceptance of yourself in this world, as it is as you find yourself with all your lumps and bumps and your mistakes and your um, false beliefs and or things that you believe are mistakes, which are really only lessons that you fail to learn, um, accepting the perfection of even that in the miscreative appearance of the reality you seem to find yourself in that's perfect too you know so in eternity and this is an as above so below analogy in eternity the natural state of being is perfect changelessness eternal changelessness everything's the same forever and believe me I know you're going to say well that sounds boring but having experienced it, uh, it is not boring. It is natural. It's it's something that I can't explain. It's like the ocean being the ocean forever. And it's like there's a there's an acceptance that that's what I am. I am the ocean. I mean, you know, just figuratively speaking, but I am the ocean. I need to go back to being the ocean because trying to be a drop of water on its own separate from the ocean is, uh, it's not where it's at. <laughs> that's why you feel like you don't belong here in this world why you feel like you don't fit in and why everything seems to be so difficult you know but the nature of that in eternity is being above so below so the nature of being in eternity being constant changelessness or forever changelessness on earth the below of that because everything here is the opposite of that um Finding yourself in that state of being requires a mindset of constant change. Which is why it doesn't do any good to try and control the landscape here and keep everything the same. Even though, you know, and people always think if I can just control everything, you know, and just have my own little slice of paradise so nothing changes, I'll be at peace. But uh, that's not how it works. You know, you'll end up getting bored with that and feeling that emptiness again within yourself and you'll be wondering again why you have this sort of existential, internal feeling that something's wrong, you don't fit in, and this isn't your home, all that sort of stuff, you know. And, uh, of course, you can live like that for a long, long time, but uh, the idea of constant change here going with the flow, let's call it that, going with the flow which requires a mindset of constant change actually allows you to stay peaceful. So you're just kind of in this constancy of like acceptance, this constancy of, yep, whatever. I'm good with whatever shows up because I have no private agenda anymore. I've decided to dump my ego and just go with the flow. Now, the opportunities to dump your ego, which is only an idea about yourself anyway, it's not a real thing. It's an idea of opposition to the flow. It's an idea of self-will rather than divine will or free will rather than divine will. And when you let that go and just become a observer of life or a tourist of life, let's say, rather than someone who's trying to fulfill some kind of an agenda, your mind begins to align with, and just automatically, because it's part of it anyway, begins to align with the natural flow of reality in this world, in this place. You basically uh, resist not evil. You're letting go of resistance. Evil, not as the connotations we have learned of it from religion, but evil as an Aramaic word, which means uh, not quite in alignment or not quite um, evil. So kata, I think, is the Aramaic word for evil, which is the Latin. I'd have to go and look it up again. But anyway, it means something like um, not performing properly or not... Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> 
It's, <laughs> it's something like that. There's a lot of variation in the Aramaic, so it's just interesting. I did used to have a book that was a brilliant translation book and one little simple word in English can have a profound meaning in uh, Aramaic, but uh, which is why I guess uh, those who tried to translate over the years from uh, Aramaic to Persian to Greek to Latin to English, etc., had probably such a hard time trying to do it and uh, they can definitely be forgiven for any mistakes they made along the way. Um, so going with the flow, it can be difficult, like, you know, and it's like knowing what I know, you know, knowing the truth as being eternal, whole and perfect forever, and still finding myself circumscribed by the use of this body and when I say I, I'm talking about I as mine, still finding myself circumscribed by the use of this body as an instrument for helping to uh, spread this message and uh, offer this curriculum, in my case, through A Course in Miracles, the universal curriculum through A Course in Miracles. Um, it's every day. Like, it's an everyday conscious awareness of the letting go it's a conscious decision made every moment and that's what it gets down to and you begin to train the mind along those lines and eventually it begins to do it itself but you, you still seem to have I had, one, <laughs> I had one just prior to making this video which is why this video isn't what I was going to make it about um, but I just had a moment of just realising I have to let go of something again and again and again and it's like this constant thing even though the temptation is to want to put my two cents worth in and offer um, offer advice, you know, and um, try to put my own perception onto a situation that um, I think can be changed or can be made the better of by doing that, you know. But without that, someone is actually asking for your help you know, and this is a tough lesson to turn uh, to learn, especially with loved ones. Unless somebody's actually asking, their mind is closed to whatever your to, to whatever you might think you want to offer. You know, so and in the case of loved ones, that can be quite hard to bear. You know, you have to allow people to get the results of their own thinking, even if that means making bad financial decisions and losing all their money in a in a knee jerk or a hip jerk. I think is the the thing, a uh, reaction to uh, a situation they find themselves in, you know, but in my particular case in that situation, it ended nicely with um, the joint decision to allow Jesus to sort everything out, but the, the, the machinations of getting to that point can be a tug of war with the heart and the mind and the reasonability of why you would want to let go and let God uh, in the face of what seems to be uh, often very simple decision making processes that you know and you, th and you think why doesn't the other person understand or what am I not getting about this situation or is there something I'm missing here and it's, it seems to be that like there's always a little simple little thing if you could just work it out you know you could offer the perfect solution but of course, in this world, there is no perfect solution because it's not a real place. It's a place where problems is what the world's purpose is to keep and to keep you invested in uh, trying to solve them so that you fail to spend your time uh, beneficially um, seeking the truth within your own mind, you know, the kingdom of heaven within. I love in the Bible when Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. But how many people actually do that? I mean, I kind of did it very circuitously. I, I realized in my very early years, in my probably mid to late teens, that there had to be more to this world than what I was told and what I'd experienced so far. And I was a very open-minded person to the esoteric themes that ran through the world of spiritual... Um, or ran through the spiritual world that, that I could connect with and that sort of thing. But there was always this thirst for more. So I think in my case, 
definitely the black sheep of my family. <laughs> and then reaching enlightenment at 33, you know, it's a funny thing. So the thing I did, anyway, that's just chit chat, not really anything particular, but you might relate to it, you know, you might relate to that. But the solution to any kind of problem or any kind of social situation that shows up here requiring some sort of decision making is always going to drop back into let go and let God, always. Because the whole thing has to be divine. The whole thing has to be miracle minded. So, um, The actual content of this video that I did want to make was something Annie and I talked about the other day on the couch. Uh, if you haven't seen that video, it's probably a cool little video. I haven't reviewed it. Sometimes I'll go back and re-watch a video that I've made if I think uh, maybe I went off track or whatever and I'll delete it or something. But talking about this stuff tends to lead to a little bit of mind wandering where there's this feeling like I need to um, set the background for what I'm trying to talk about a lot. And... Um, setting that background often leads into other territory and I get sidetracked and before you know it um, <laughs> I don't know what I was talking about but anyway in this case um, and it's always useful I mean it goes from one useful thing to another useful thing I've, I've really really learnt that you know that um, when you're listening to somebody even if it's not a specific spiritual thing when you're listening to somebody um, if you're truly listening and truly hearing what's being said instead of just interpreting what you think's being said with your thoughts if you're truly allowing yourself to hear to just listen to the presentation as if you were listening politely to someone who spoke a different language perhaps um, but if you just allow yourself to listen and to hear and to truly focus and let in um, what's being said you'll hear something even if it's just a couple of words but one of the things that um and I've just got a little sidetrack there. One of the things that uh, Annie and I were talking about on the couch just briefly in our last video was the idea that in Zoom meetings, connecting or joining in mind with people is... Uh, Annie seems to think it's quite simple and easy for her. And I tend to think that it... Whilst it whilst when it happens it is simple and easy but I tend to think that the orchestration for it to happen in Zoom meetings um, because of the amount of people and the nature of the vibration that I sense the nature of the how would I talk about this it's like a multiverse of associations that show up at a Zoom meeting. You've got 10 or 12 people, each one representing their own package. And you're sensitive to all of it, right? So I'm sensitive to all of it. My mind opens and I feel the whole room. Out of that, sometimes I feel one specific person and connect with that one specific person. And it's very much a one-to-one -one personal kind of thing. However when I have somebody in proximity, like in my room or a few people in my room, I can actually go around, and this is just talking more like, it's, I guess it's a kind of a phenomena associated with healing, but I can actually go around the room and put hands on people, put my hands on people and get a sense of their vibration. It's like I'm feeling their aura rather than seeing it. Some people see auras. I don't particularly see auras I can pick up on the vibe but generally if I hold someone's hand or put my hand on their shoulders hands on their shoulders something like that or on their chest I get a very strong connection um, because we are connected and it's the only way I can talk about it is that the vibration that I get or the feeling that I get or the I don't know what it is but I get, I get the span I get the span or the gap or the difference in the teaching learning equilibrium that the two of us are playing out let's say I don't know if that makes sense so if you've got one bucket of water that's full 
And Jesus says in, in any given situation, it only takes one person to be in, of sane mind to heal both, you know. So, um, so if somebody comes, let's say, for healing, and I guess I'm trying to put this out there for my own because I want to look at it as an idea of limitation and uh, the idea of going beyond that limitation, but it's like I feel the difference in that brother, let's say, that the teaching learning uh, situation represents, right? So in the course, Jesus talks about every opportunity uh, to join with another brother is an opportunity to bring uh, the teaching and learning equilibrium um, into harmony, you know, like to, to, to make it equal. And uh, when I put hands on somebody, I feel a certain thing that in me, because I'm looking at my mind, I'm accepting atonement for myself, for me is an absence of, what would I call it? An absence of felicity? No. <laughs> I think that's a book by Marianne Williamson, actually. Probably a good book, Absence from Felicity. An absence of something. Let's just call it the something. An absence of or a lack of love. We could put it as a lack of love. And the opportunity, the opportunity presented in the teaching learning situation that is presented is the opportunity to um, rectify or to heal that lack of love. Right, so it's always a lack of love in me represented by somebody outside of myself saying I'm sick, I'm depressed, I'm whatever. And then in my own process of accepting atonement for that because uh, you know these are my brothers and they're playing the part I've asked them to play and I'm taking responsibility for the entirety of my world and all the effects of my own idea of separation which is now being presented in this situation. Um, I feel the healing in me. I feel the healing of that difference, of that lack in me. And it transfers automatically um, to the person depending on, hey, what are you guys doing? Come for a visit. Depending on um, how advanced maybe, and this is the bit I don't really know how to talk about. I find that with somebody who's had exposure to the workbook of A Course in Miracles, it's much easier to have a combined experience, a joining, because there is an awareness. And I know Dr. Fritz used to do this with people. He would, he would educate people about what was going to happen in his healings in South America so that they could actually... Um, hey, you want a leaf? That's only a leaf. Sorry, I know, I know you thought it was something else, but... These guys are so cool. You had some good worms? Hey? No? No? All right. <laughs> Visitors. I think they like the energy. So, there's this... Um, there's this occurrence and if somebody's had exposure to the principles and had exposure to the ideas of oh yeah yep the ideas of healing um divinely i find that there is this ability to join in mind right so in the course it says healing shows you that minds are joined that that minds are one but if somebody is, let's say, just straight off the street, and I've had many experiences of this, um, whilst I can recognise the void or the lack or the difference in the relationship which has to be healed, um, it doesn't always transfer. It doesn't always, and I don't think transfer is the right word, it doesn't always become recognised. That's probably better. But with somebody who's doing Course in Miracles, we tend to... Um, or. or who's been on some kind of spiritual loop for a while, we tend to be able to join in mind and have these synchronistic, and it's not really synchronicity because it's one thing, it's one mind. So 
synchronizing, which is why um, the idea of uh, synchronicity in just general terms in itself is uh, not really a, an accurate way to describe the synchronicity of things showing up when you think about them, because uh, of course they show up because it's just mind. Everything is an idea, and if you think about it, it's becoming manifest as you think about it somewhere in space and time. So it's not unusual. You're going to be bumping into things that you've been thinking about. Um, but there's this ability in the hands-on situation to have this connection, and I remember Joel Goldsmith talking about it, and I'm not particularly sure that he was a hands-on sort of guy. I know he had an office that he opened specifically for healing and people would just come and talk to him about their problems and he would just open his mind and accept responsibility for it with the same understanding that these are not people with problems. This is my mind offering me an opportunity to heal a perceived lack or a perceived difference or a perceived something else. And uh, he would have people Oh, look at that. There's a very lucky worm there. <laughs> a very lucky worm going from one hole to another, I suppose. The amount of magpies around here. Very daring worm. But he would have experiences uh, of simply doing that. He wouldn't charge anyone any money. Uh, the same, I don't charge anyone any money either. Um, but people would write back to him like three months later and they'd say things like, I don't know what you did that day, but something changed and uh, it took me a few months to realise it. And um, There was this kind of thing that he would have, you know, and uh, it's very much the same with me. And um, I'm just wanting to keep this very personal so I can examine it. And I would <laughs> I'll definitely be watching this video in a minute when I finish it. But I have the same responses. I have people writing to me about things that we interacted over years ago and they're like, dude, I don't know what happened years ago but my life is totally different now and it all, all stems back to that moment, you know. And So that physical connection, being in proximity and so on, that seems to work for me as an idea of the gift of the spirit, let's say, which is what I really wanted to talk about on this video, the gifts of the spirit, which can be uh, prophecy and clairvoyance and all sorts of stuff. But I mean, prophecy is not particularly helpful if you understand the nature of it truly. Um, if you're being prophetic to people that understand how to control the nature of their uh, cause and effect relationships or how to heal them, then perhaps there might be some sort of avenue for that use. But most people, if you offer them a prophecy, they're either going to try to exploit it or become fearful of it, and it's going to just set up another cycle of cause and effect relationship that they're going to have to doubly down on for healing next time it comes around. And, uh, of course, you're going to be responsible for that. <laughs> it adds to your own karma because just as healing is shared, so is karma. Right. Um, I get the results of my own thinking and uh, my thoughts affect everyone and everything, which is why it's important to um, keep a very low profile emotional footprint, if you understand what I mean by that. Um, but the idea then of doing that on a Zoom meeting, in a Zoom meeting, whilst I have been witness to that occurrence in a Zoom meeting, it seems, and I know time doesn't come into it and space doesn't come into it, distance doesn't come into it because all healing is instantaneous. Um, regardless of where you are in the universe or the, in the multiverse, it doesn't matter. Um, but it seems to be, and this is what I'm trying to pry out of my thinking here, it seems to be that I have an idea that it's different. <laughs> when in fact it shouldn't be. But, or my theory, my theory and my thinking tells me it shouldn't be, but that's only if I use my own theory and my thinking, you know, realizing my thoughts don't mean anything to try and guide me on it, which I'm not wanting to. So I think it's opening up, opening up to a point of being more honest or being totally honest about looking at the situation, which is very difficult to do while staying present. Um, it's going to be something that requires some kind of meditative guidance to look at, I think, which 
That's just how it feels anyway. Everyone has their own use and usefulness. And I like to think that a person's usefulness shouldn't be limited, even though I know that it can be limited by their own self-doubt, self-fear, self, etc. But because I am in a healing process, this too is something to look at, I think. Maybe it's something to look at, maybe it's not. I'm just gonna probably sit with it for a few days. But um, I think in a general sense too, I enjoy, this is probably part of it, I enjoy the, uh, the physical interaction because this is a physical transformation. It happens at a cellular level. And I have seen a lot more in diversity, let's say, of healing on a one-to-one -one physical basis through my hands than on a Zoom meeting. A Zoom meeting tends to be more in the form of a release with a synchronized, or a, not a synchronized, with a, a unified um, aspect to it through the release, such as the laughter, synchronized laughter, or, or one laughter through two people, um, etc. But in the many, many, many instances, like countless instances that I have had of doing sessions, doing workshops, doing one-to-one -one healings, doing all this stuff for the last 25 years or more, um, definitely the transference, transference, the connection, the whatever it is that occurs, we're just going to go for the general term, the whatever it is that occurs uh, in the moment of healing, the miraculous nature of that, better, the miraculous nature of what occurs during the healing is a much bigger stage production, let's say, is a much bigger playing out. It offers a greater witness. It's a more unmistakable I don't know how to talk about that like people will I mean I'm going to tell you but you know um, oh god I remember we used to have to go and get a bowl for my friend Alana a big bowl because she would vomit in the in the session room on the carpet she, stuff would start happening for her and she would just puke and she would cough and fart and carry on and she couldn't stop it couldn't help it and I knew that it was occurring naturally and uh, I used to fall over a lot. I used to like completely fall to the ground a lot. It was as if I was being struck by lightning and my body just couldn't keep itself upright and my knees would go. And and everybody has di a different kind of reaction to the light, which in the Zoom meetings, I won't say it's not as much fun in that regard, but it's not as, <laughs> it's not as vivid, it's not as animated, it's not as... Um, and there are moments, I'm not, I'm not saying it's all not as vivid or animated, there are moments, but um, yeah, hard to know. It's a, it's, I'm gonna sit with this one for a few days and just ask within for some kind of clarity, if clarity is needed, or maybe everything's just fine how it is. But I, when I was talking to Annie, I, got a, I did get a prompt to look at it to look at that idea and so that's part of what this video is about bringing it to the fore bringing it to the front of my awareness that it needs to be looked at and bringing it out of the haze and the fog of my consciousness which i know will try to tuck it away again right ego always likes to tuck things away just quietly and secretly so that you don't look at them and you get a sometimes you get a glimpse of things and you go oh I didn't like that about myself or there's a there's a bit of my personal nature that I could probably uh, forgive you know and then the next thing when it comes around to um, doing the work and you think about I'll do that when I get home because I'm at work at the moment and I don't want to have a screaming crying falling apart mess in the office or whatever and when you get around to it, of course, the the um, the relevance of it or the impact of it is kind of gone because it's it's the moment's already passed, and you're you're trying to heal it from recollection, which isn't impossible. But I always find it's more efficient if you can do it in the moment. Um, 
yeah, I think that's about it. I think that's about it. So that'll be good. That'll be a nice one to follow. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Thank you for the questions too. Some of you guys asked some really cool questions and I'm open to everything. Um, some people ask me questions. I mean, I've got hundreds of videos. So maybe if you watch a couple of videos first and if you don't find that the answer just comes naturally through a video you watch, then sure, I'm open to to that. But Tina and I do spend a little bit of time rummaging through those videos trying to find some kind of link or something for people now and then, then and it takes a fair bit of time, which uh, I think it would be better spent by you guys using that time because it gives you that idea of purpose and it helps to put you more solidly into the idea that this is actually something that you're participating in rather than a video that you're just watching. Right? And I, I know it's only a very small thing, but um, I know often I'll just open A Course in Miracles, and not, not lately, but when I was really using it, um, I would just open it like an oracle and the answer to my question would be on the page that I, <laughs> it was just miraculous. You know, it would just be there. It's like, oh, that's what I was just thinking about. And there it is. Boom. So that would be cool. And thank you again for the donations. I'm going to contact Tina today about doing the final bit of editing in the front. Annie, who was very close to my teacher, Ted, uh, in, a, in a way, um, is going to provide a small uh, accompaniment to go in the back from him, um, which will be very cool. Um, yeah, and we should have those printed within, I've just sent a few off to other people, but we should have those new ones printed within a month, I'm hoping. Let's get it done. Tina, are you hearing that? Let's get it done. <laughs> All right, I love you guys. I really do. I love you. I love you. I can't tell you how much I love you it's what I feel in my heart and it's like this universal just you guys are a blessing to me and I am totally grateful and you have my total um, acceptance for wherever you're at with whatever you're at no matter what guilt ridden um, self doubt plagued whatever I mean you can write to me about anything and I promise you I will not judge if you knew where I've been. <laughs> if you want to write to me privately, some of you guys express the, the desire to do that, but if you want to write to me privately, um, go on my Facebook, Dave Fair, P-H-A-R-E, and um, you can uh, send me a message on there. Oh, you worked it out as... It's not a worm. It's not a worm. No, it's a stick. You can dig for a worm with a stick. That's called evolution. Hey, eh? You guys are beautiful. There's a worm right there. Look, I shouldn't tell you, but there is. Or was. All right. I love you. Peace.